first thing you'd want to ask, well, if we're going to talk about inclusion, who's being left out? Because inclusion wouldn't be an issue if everybody was included. We wouldn't even be talking about it, right? We only talk about it if somebody's getting left out. Well, who's getting left out? I'm going to share some data with you. If we look at black people, and let's just name the fact that we're here in the United States of America where there is a racial hierarchy and black people are on the bottom. Now, if anyone disagrees with me, I'd like to know who you see are worse off than black people in America. I just open it up in case anyone disagrees with me. Like the data are clear historically that in the racial hierarchy of America, black people are on the bottom. In my research, I've also found that, um, like for example, in Brazil, which has the largest population of black people outside of Africa in the world. And in Brazil, there is a racial hierarchy and black people are on the bottom. Now, there's a lot of Brazilians here. Somebody tell me that I'm saying the wrong thing. Is there somebody underneath black people in the hierarchy, racial hierarchy in Brazil? Wasn't it just, re there wasn't the first, I think it's called the Beleza. What is it, the lady that is the queen of the carnival? Wasn't it just the first black queen of carnival was the first one ever just a few years ago? Um, Globaleza, right, Globaleza, right? There was just the, the first black one was, was just recently, right? Um, so, so this is, so this is, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on Brazil. I'm an expert on what happens in the U.S. But I've, in my readings, I'm like, yeah, it seems like this is a, this is a global problem. But if we look just, this is data about, like I think the mic might be going in and out, but I'm going to keep going. So if we look at these two lines all the way across, the blue line represents black people and the darker gray line represents white people. And in every single one of these measures with this data that was collected, black people don't, um, are not rewarded in line with their contributions, don't um, experience the same opportunities, aren't being treated fairly, uh, that their diverse perspective is not welcomed, that they're not trusted or respected, they're not encouraged to be themselves, or feel like they can share who they are. And this is that other word that gets talked about a lot, right? Belonging, right? Some of you who, who listen to these words, you hear that's also belonging. Well, the first part of belonging, like after you're included, and then you can belong if you can bring your whole self. But if you don't feel like you can do that, you know, it then, then it becomes hard. And for black people especially, this gets very interesting because anyone who has any black features in general will try to suppress them. If they have curly hair, they will try and straighten it. If there's dark skin, they will try and lighten it. There's all these things we do because we don't want to be associated with the bottom of the racial hierarchy. That's just real, right? Maybe, maybe not every single person, but enough to where this is a multi-billion dollar industry. So enough people do this in order to keep these businesses alive, right? Yet conversely, while black people are being hated, black people are still being emulated. So for the same amount of people that are straightening their hair, there are people with straight hair that are curling it. For the same number of people that are bleaching their skin, they're the tanning industry is a multi-billion dollar industry as well, so you can tan. There's, for all of the insults about the black woman's body, there are also an equally, you know, multi-million dollar industry with the Brazilian butt lift, right? This surgery so you can look like a black woman, right? So it's just an interesting, you know, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy. It's an interesting conundrum, right? It's an interesting conflict. So let's poke at it a little bit. Thinking still about the workplace. We're in and out, but I'm going to keep going. Um, if you think about all these black people that are at work, and just real quick show of hands, how many people work with somebody black? Just raise your hand. Okay, so almost half the room. Okay, how many people work with Not sure. Raise your hand. Might be black, you don't know. Like for example, I'm half black, and according to the laws of America, I'm black. They have something called a one drop rule. So if there so if there was ever anything where there were, there were laws impacting black people, I would be included in that. And I'm probably light as a lot of the light folks in here. And I don't hide. I don't straighten my hair or, you know, do anything to, to hide that. So just because you don't think somebody's black doesn't necessarily mean. Because passing for not black is something that folks would do who don't want to be at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. Just saying. So... You look at now your, your black friends at work, those of you that work with black people. 
again, the same, this is, not, by the way, this survey, it's not a small data set. It was like 10,000 workers across the United States in multiple industries were, were interviewed for this. So this isn't like, oh, we just talked to 10 people, you know, at the store around the corner. No, this is like a broad sampling of workers across the U.S. That while almost all of them say there's like a mentorship or sponsorship program at their work, only a third of them say that they actually have someone helping them and less than a quarter of them feel that they actually have support from that sponsor. Because that's normally how you would advance in your workplace, regardless of what industry you're in. If you're in corporate America, if you are in industrial America, in general, you would have someone that's above you that you make friends with or that is um, interested in you and would help you to learn more and help you grow your career. This is something uh, very much that happens in white corporate America. They call it like the good old boys network where, you know, you your friend's son needs a job and then you hook them up, whether they're qualified or not, you know, you, you get them an internship and where internships are very difficult to come by for the most part. If you um, do not have a stellar GPA, come from a very prestigious university, this is how things get done here. So this is the, the condition just in the workplace. But I could show you data in every single area of opportunity and challenge, whether it's the education system, whether it's the financial sector, whether it's the justice system, whether it is um, uh, the banking system, at every s health and uh, health services, human services, childbirth outcomes. There's not one area of opportunity or challenge where black people in America are not absolutely on the bottom, that there is a disparity in the outcomes that black people are experiencing. So how do we get here? It's worth like just setting a tiny little historical context, right? And then we'll talk about what we can do. I think it's important to set the stage. And I will say this, uh, I can say this here, you know, we're family, this is the Spiritus Center. We all know what we do here. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you here had the opportunity uh, last week to be here when the African mentors were here. Um, it was a really beautiful, beautiful event. I hope we do it again. It was a, such a lovely event. Uh, and I had an opportunity to speak to one of those mentors, and I was talking about the work that I do because I manage a racial equity program. So this is like what I do all day. And I was told specifically, you should be talking about this at the center. And I said, okay, because this isn't something I would normally I would normally talk about more like how in a reformation and like how we can grow and stuff like why would I talk about this massive injustice that's taking place and well when you're told to do something by a mentor if you're blessed to have a conversation they tell you to do it it's a good look to do it so here we are so a little bit of history so in the US if we look back 402 years everyone knows about slavery and all of us have been to school we know about that but if you look at the history of a country and what percentage of time that we've spent in certain categories, this first row, there's a lot of data there. I just want you to look at that last column. That 61% of America's history was enslaving black people, where black people were not legislatively human. For more than half of this country's history, black people were not human by law. Like, just let that sink in for a minute. 61% of the time. For 25% of our history, that's another 100 years, well, slavery may have been outlawed, but there was still a lot of bad things happening. A lot of bad things happening. There was very little human rights. I'm not going to go into the detail of that. It's not necessary. We're just looking at the percentage of time that we've spent. And only 14% of this nation's history have we spent where black people have been human according to the law. 14% of this nation's history. So why am I saying, why am I bringing this? If you've only been doing something for 14% of your life or 14% of your history, you're not going to be very good at it yet, right? We're still learning. Like, this isn't where I'm bashing this country. I love this country. I was born here. It's a beautiful place. I have nothing bad to say about this country. We're just looking at the history to form an analysis of how things are and what we might do differently that we could all enjoy this humanity that was legislatively denied to this group of people. That even today, we're still seeing that there's some, some residuality there. So I think it's also fair to say that when you just start something, you're not very good at it. For example, I'm a student of Portuguese. I'm a new student. I got way less than 15% of my life studying Portuguese. Portuguese is hard to learn. 
right? It's hard. It's there's conjugating verbs. It's like the nos format, eo format, voce format. You know, eo bebo, voce bebe, nos bebemos. It's like it's you know trying to get the the conjugation. It's very hard, and I'm not good at it. I have to stop. I have to think, and I mess it up all the time when I'm talking. I'm not good at it. And are you going to be mad at me because like I'm not good at it? You're probably going to be like, oh, it's okay. Like keep trying. So that's kind of how I'm looking at this. I'm not like America's this horrible place for you know. It's like no, we're we're trying. We're we're learning. We don't really know how to do it. We're trying and stumbling, just like anyone would be learning a new skill, right? So this is some some history. Interestingly, in order to keep these structures alive, there was one thing that had to happen. And this is still happening today. And there had to be a portrayal of black people as not human in order to justify, you know, almost 300 years of legislative non-humanity. But once the laws said black people were human, the narrative that says black people are dangerous, black people are substandard, black people are aggressive black people are there's all of this in fact for mass incarceration to work if anyone's familiar with the war on drugs here black people especially black children were portrayed as super predators in order to be tried in the courts like an adult so you saw 13 year old black boys getting life sentences for a nominal amount of drugs whereas now it's legal to have most of these drugs. Anyway, so we got a long history of not acknowledging humanity. I was going to say all this really kindly and compassionately, just the way I would want, if I was the person who needed to learn a new skill, how I would want someone to talk about my lack of skill, kindly and gently and with love, right? We've got this long history of unskilled treatment of humans and this huge opportunity to do something different, right? When I was asking Father Joseph, or Brother Joseph, I'm not sure, I think it's Father, Father Joseph? Yes, asking Father Joseph um, if this, if, you know, people who engage in this sort of work, if this work is actually helpful because it's such a huge problem. Um, what the mentor said was, it's like imagine there's like a hole um, of suffering a massive hole of suffering on this plane. Um, and, um, and every little thing that we do, there's not hardly anyone that's doing this work, but you're like putting grains of sand, you know, in this hole to help to fill it. But when you think about on the spiritual plane, that there's the, it's immeasurable how much suffering there is from those that have passed through this that are still, that are still suffering. And that's why all of our help is desperately needed to, you know, help in anything we can do in the center to help with the spiritual work, to help with, for those that feel called to do it, to help with mediumship, right? So every Wednesday night, there's a study to um, help to learn these skills on how we can help. I encourage everyone uh, to consider that. All right, so we look at the modern day. So how does this show up? That's the history. How does this show up at work? So all of y'all that work with black people, raise your hands again. Who works with black people? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. And how many people, you work with somebody brownish, but you're not sure if they're black? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, all right, okay. That's almost it. This is what's happening every day. Every day that that person you work with goes to work, this is what they're dealing with. They have people saying things to them. There's this term microaggressions. I don't, I don't like this word micro, but it's basically racialized insults. You're being insulted because of your race. It's just every day. Every day. Just imagine that for a minute. If someone insulted you every day because you were Brazilian, every day, and with the insinuation that your Brazilian heritage made you less than human and dangerous and unprofessional and untrustworthy. Just imagine that for a minute, that you had to hold that every day. And, and then on top of that, you would be expected to educate them about why being a Brazilian is not bad. Like, why being a Brazilian means you're a good person. You educate them that not liking Brazilians is not good. And on top of that, they're asking you to lead efforts to help people understand that Brazilians are good. Why would you, should you have to do that? <laughs> right? That doesn't make any sense. 
You already know that you're good. Why do you need to tell? No, somebody that, that's willing to expand their humanity should do that. Imagine that every day, that's your reality. But then it gets worse. That's just what people are saying to you. Here's what people are doing. This happens to every black person every day at their work are not, not able to contribute, raise their hand in a meeting, or want to offer something to the group, it's blocked. When you get to contribute something, you don't get credit. Passed over for promotions, recognition, and then held to a higher standard, because remember, you're not exactly human, you're not 100% worthy, you are dangerous, so we need to see a little more, you have to prove yourself. This is why every black mama ever tells their black children, you gotta work twice as hard for half the recognition to get anywhere in the workplace here. Every single black person has had that said to them. If one day black mom, it was a black auntie or uncle or, or granny said that to them, right? Work twice as hard, so because why? Because there's this un, unfair standard, right? There's, t say what? If it's a woman, it's three times as hard. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't get started with the intersections of gender because then it's a whole nother, it's, it's a whole nother thing. So, so all of these things are happening and here's what happens. You would think, well, why aren't black people saying anything? I mean, if you're dealing with that all day, every day, why don't you say something? Do you really think black people don't say anything? Of course they do. Well, guess what happens when they do? Anyone ever heard of DARVO? Okay, so DARVO, this is a strategy that's used to enforce silence. Now, you, you've seen this and just don't realize it. How it normally plays out, this is where you see it in the public eye, is um, when someone has been accused of sexual violence. So we saw this with, um, with uh, several public figures recently and um, you know, accused of something. So what do they do? It didn't happen. It just didn't happen. They'll just deny that it happened. Okay, and I'm not saying guilt or innocence of any of these people. There's no judgment. We're just looking at a strategy that played out in the media that's important for us as humans to recognize when we see this strategy, what it is, so that we can then bring a higher element of humanity, bring a higher vibration, bring more love. And we're going to talk about how to do what it is that's happening. Then it becomes difficult because it's a very... So what happens? Is this going in and out? Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so the first thing is deny. That didn't happen. And then attack. Attack the person's character. So let me, let me give you an idea of what this might look like. So first, let's say, you know, I... Let's say Raphael is black. And I say, you know, Raphael, wow. Um, you know, for a black person, you seem pretty smart. You seem, you're very well spoken. Like you're so articulate. Like, wow. This happens constantly for black people. So then Raphael must think, that a surprise? Like you act like you didn't expect that. Like that's a shock to you. So you're 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 complimenting me because like <laughs> this black person's smart. This black person is well spoken. Right? So if you decide you want to say something to me like that's kind of offensive. I you know, why would why would you say that to me, Cara? You know me and why why that's insulting. You're acting like you're surprised as though my blackness would mean I'm not smart. Like, you have every right to say that. Trust me, black people speak up. And then they get this. You tell me, that's offensive. I say, I didn't say anything offensive. First, I deny. Knowing you, but you heard me. And now, how am I going to let you know what offended you? I'm now denying your experience, right? But let's say I don't even do that. I say, well, wait a minute, Raphael. What about you? You seem a little annoyed right now. Like, are you okay? Are you feeling a little emotional? Like, is this too intense for you? And then I will try and see if I can get you off balance. And if I do that well enough, because remember, all day, every day, you're dealing with this. So your emotions are probably going to be a little high, right? And I can say, look at you right now. You even seem a little annoyed. Now you're going to have to do is defend yourself. And my, and, and, and my behavior is no longer on the table, right? That's the, that's the attack. And the RVO, the reverse victim and offender, is the most insidious part. This is where I say, and Raphael, I'm so hurt that you would think that I'm not a racist. I'm a good person. 
oh my god, did you guys just hear he accused me of being a racist? Oh my god. Right? I have a black friend. And if I'm a white woman or a white man and I start to get upset, trust and believe here in America, all, all bets are off. If a white woman starts crying, everyone's going to rush to make sure she's okay. Raphael, or if this is a black, per black woman, off the table. This is a daily occurrence. Daily. So all those black people you work with, start paying attention. Right? Start paying attention. And you see this happen, there are things you can do. Right? And we'll talk about that. But also, this isn't just people accused of sexual violence. This isn't just people who uh, do racist things. This is also you and me. My daughter, you know, anyone, who <laughs> anyone who's blessed to have teen children, whew, and they will tell you the truth. I was doing this research for another presentation, and my daughter, you know, didn't clean the kitchen. And I said, can you clean the kitchen? You know, you know, and she's like, oh, I, I did. I was like, no, you didn't. It's not clean. Look, you missed this. And you know what? I'm really tired of you not cleaning the kitchen. She said, Mom, you're dargoing me. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you just deny it. You're denying that you're attacking me. And now you're like, and then you never clean the kitchen. because I was like, oh, my God. Right? <laughs> so before you think, oh, I'm above it all. Right? I we're listening to, like, these horrible white people. do. Like, it's in all of us. This is an inner reformation for us. We darvo when we're being asked to be accountable for our poor behavior. And what's, what is inner reformation all about? It's changing our behavior, changing inside, so we can be more kind and loving to each other. So we're not above this, right? None of us are above it, right? So let's just talk about the impacts of this, and then we'll talk about what we can do. Here's what ends up happening for people who are victims of racism at work, of which black people are the greatest number, right? There's all these physical impacts, right? And a lot of psychological impacts, and there's, there's um, the health starts to suffer because of that. But psychologically, this internal dilemma that this talks about, let me give you an idea what this looks like. So let's go back to Raphael. I'm picking on him because he's probably one of the lightest people in the room. So, <laughs> so let's say I say, Raphael, you're so smart for a black person. Oh, my God, look at you. You know, you're so articulate and everything. Wow, I'm surprising. So Raphael's going to start, before he says anything to me, there's going to be some thinking. Is she saying that because I'm black? Does she really mean that? Is she trying to be offensive? Uh, should I say something? Should I speak up? Should I speak up now? Should I speak up later? Should I speak up in public? Should I speak up in private? If I speak up and we're at work, is this a career decision? Is this a promotion decision? Is this a relationship decision? What kind of decision is this? What will happen? Spin, 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 spin. And if he cares about me, there's going to be even more spin. If he doesn't care about me, there's still a lot of spin because we're in the workplace. He's Every relationship at work, you don't know. You have no idea what impacts that person could have for you, right? So then that causes the anxiety and depression, right? It, the simplest ways to explain anxiety and depression, anxiety is worry about the future, depression, sadness about the past. Super easy definition. It's way deeper than that, but that's a very simple top-line definition. So he'll be experiencing anxiety. If I do this, will that happen? If I do this, will this happen? It's that worry, what's going to happen in the future? There may be some depression because perhaps he's spoken up in the past and it didn't go well. And he remembers that. And it still feels sad inside about that, that sadness about the past, right? And then this emotional, you know, self-doubt, right? Is, did, I, did, I, did, did she do that? Did she really do it? Am I sure? Am I being oversensitive? Am I, be, am I overplaying race? Maybe it wasn't race. Maybe, right? We start to question ourselves because this is happening all day, every day, <laughs> in like almost every encounter that we're having. And then there's this emotional tax. Guess what he still has to do? You still got to do your job. You still got to advance strategy. You still got to produce deliverables. You have to meet budgets. You have to show up on time, make right, do work twice as hard for half of the recognition. While all of that is happening, you're working harder than anybody else. Think about every black person you work with. Did you know that's what they were dealing with? Did you know? Every black person you work with. This is data and evidence-based. This is not my opinion. This is not my emotions. This is data. Start noticing the black people that you work with, right? Start noticing. And even though it says diminish problem-solving abilities, because as a black person, you have to be overqualified to get employed anywhere, and you already used to working twice as hard for half of the recognition, 
you're golden because you, in fact, are super smart, which is what caused this whole conversation in the first place, is that in general, to be a black person in any workplace, you have to be smarter than anybody else to get in there. So for me to say that is triply insulting now because you're more than likely smarter than me, worked harder to get the job, most, and got the job on your merits, whereas I probably got the job because I'm not a black human being. Look at that. Pit the black people you work with, people. And financially, let's think about, you know, all, those pe all, all of us that work where black people work, this number is staggering. $284.7 billion a year is what racism costs U.S. businesses a year. So all of this talk that we're hearing now, oh, well, if we do diversity and inclusion and black people and brown people start getting more jobs, what's going to happen to the rest of us? What, you know, what, we're, we're affirmative action is now being uh, taken out of our uh, legal system because they're worried that the white children won't have any opportunities. If we remove racism from the businesses alone, look at how much money gets put back into the economy. Everybody will have a job. Everybody will have an education. There's more than enough resources available for all of us. This is an abundant country. It's an abundant universe. It's an abundant planet. There is more than enough if we love one another and treat each other kindly. There is more than enough for everyone. So if you are an ally, meaning someone who works with one of those black people, so the 11 people who raise your hand that you work with black people, being an ally simply means you no longer want to be the person that watches them suffer or is ignorant of their suffering and goes about your merry way. If you're interested in doing something, here's some of the things you can do. If you see any of those racialized events in the workplace, right, this talk is only limited to interpersonal. I'm not talking about how businesses can restructure their processes. We're not talking about that. We're just human. We're just human to human, right? What can you do? If you see that foolishness, if you, if you see me say, oh, Raphael, you're like so smart. Oh my God, then you're black too. Wow, wow, right? You can interrupt and say, do you realize the work this? Did you really, you know, and the, 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 the redirect, did, are, you, are, you, are you saying that to him because he, of the great speech he just gave? Well, then tell him what a great speech he gave. It's not about, oh, I'm so surprised you're black and you're so well-spoken. If you're really trying, if you're really well-meaning and you're trying to give a compliment, then just give the compliment. Hey, I loved your speech. Your speech was amazing. You know what I loved about it? You talked about the impacts of this, and it made me feel like just so wonderful. Thank you. Like, you know how to get into all the fact that I'm black and you're surprised that I can do that. <coughs> right? So if you see that happening, you can, you can interrupt and direct. And you can educate and explain why that's, why that's offensive. Right? And, wh and why it's important to just... Um, uh, and I always say, if you're going to do all this, do it with good intent and what's called appreciative inquiry, that you assume the person had good intent, that they just wanted to compliment, right? Just assume, if you wanted to compliment, well, here's a way to do it, right? Here's a way to do it. Um, and, and, and educate them, right? Ed at any opportunity where you see someone being dehumanized, take the opportunity to educate on the importance of humanity because that helps you too. The minute we are teaching someone how to do something, we benefit. And all of our friends with us benefit too. Or the target, because at this point I've made Raphael a target because I have attacked him, right? I've basically attacked his, uh, this sounds so crazy. I like it's now like it's hearing static in my ear. Is this, the sound okay? Okay, all right, I'm gonna let, let it be okay. So to advocate, right, say not only is Raphael smart, but he, um, he's given dozens of lectures on this topic. He's known as, 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 as an expert in this topic. And really, you know, think about that before you speak to them again. Notice this little sentence that says we're smarter than pigs. There was a study in Italy in, I think it was February of this year, where they did a study on the social behavior of pigs. Pigs. And what they were trying to learn is how do pigs respond from a social perspective when there is aggressive behavior? So here's the results of the study. What they observed is when one pig is aggressive to another, looker pigs, want me to walk over here? Okay, is it better over here? Oh, I didn't know, hey, all right, we're gonna be over here. Much better, wow, how weird. Okay, so they observed the behaviors of pigs and they noticed that if one pig was aggressive to another one, they watched to see what the rest of the pigs in the group would do. And they observed two patterns, very interesting. So the first pattern they observed is if 
one of the pigs was aggressive to another pig. We're going to call them the aggressive pig and the target pig, right? So if all of the onlooker pigs rushed to the target pig to comfort it, the target pig sh showed signs of um, uh, recovering from the attack, but the aggressor pig did not change the behavior. The aggressor pig continued to be aggressive, repeated the aggressive pattern. The other pattern they noticed is if there was an aggressive pig and a target pig, and the, the aggressor attacked the target, if all of the rest of the onlooker pigs went up and surrounded the attacking pig, the aggressive pig, that the target still showed signs of improving, of feeling, you know, recovering from the attack, but the aggressive behavior stopped. Think about that for a minute. Here's what Raphael's daily experience is in the workplace according to the data. Nobody comes to me. They go to Raphael, oh, I heard what she said. That's so awful. I'm sorry. God, are you okay? Do you need to talk? They go and comfort him. Nobody comes to me and says, hey, wh why, would, why would you do that? Or did, were you trying to give him a compliment? Here, you know, not, they're not interrupt directing or educating or advocating. They're rushing to comfort. The behavior, my behavior will not change. It will not change. But if all of a sudden I start getting surrounded by people who are saying, hey, you know, there's a better way to do this, I'm much more likely to change. We're smarter than pigs, people, right? We can do this. We can do this. Nobody wants to. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask everyone that question. Luigi just asked a great question. If you stick your neck out to interrupt, educate, or advocate, what are you going to gain? I'm going to ask you all that. Do you have anything to gain from that? Okay, what, would you, what do you have to gain? You gain respect. Okay. R no? Okay. Do you all agree with that, that you, would, you, you gain respect? You were saying the respect from the target? Okay. Mm hmm. 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 Okay. Mm hmm. All right. I love that. Yonata. Mm hmm. Yes. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, and and grateful. And the, the remember what the term respect means too. Really, like literally, what it means is to look again, right? Re again, spec from spectros. It means to look again, right? So when you respect someone, you look again to make sure that you are understanding and appreciating the fullness of that person, right? So if you stick your neck out, I think there there are certain people who will respect you more, and there are people who may not. So maybe respect is not the payoff. And I like where Yanata was going with this, which is that. There doesn't necessarily have to be a payoff, right? Um, that the um, that the simple act of, for me, I, th I when I think about, I don't know if I use the word payoff, but when I think about why we're all here, we are all here to transform, right? And we transform through elevating our behavior and expressing higher forms of humanity. So this is one of the ways that we can do that. And it's not just black people at work. Everybody here knows somebody black, right? You know somebody black. You know someone and roast somebody brown. You know someone who has experiences these experiences these things. So there are other things that you can do, and then we'll um, we'll we'll close out here. So if you want to engage in some longer term supportive activities, there are things you can do, right? You can because when this says use your position of privilege, if you are not black, you have privilege. Every single one of you. If you are not black, you do not have to worry about being pulled over by the police and being killed while unarmed. You don't have to worry about it. It's not the first thing. You're probably looking for your insurance and your registration. You're not worried about being killed unarmed. If you are not black, you're not worried about walking across the street and, uh, or walking into an elevator or, 
or walking into a store and people automatically assuming you're stealing. You don't worry about that. You don't worry about whether, you know, th you don't worry about all of these areas of opportunity or challenge. You have a position of privilege. Like for me, for example, even though I'm half black, I can tell you another area of privilege I have. I am what's considered a cishet female, right? So I'm, I use the gender assigned to me at birth. I'm cisgendered. I am um, a heterosexual woman. I like men. So for a person, so that means there's all these things I don't have to think about. I just don't have to think about it. For example, like homosexuality is illegal in 27 states and look at the current legislation, right? So because I don't have to worry about that, I can rush up to you and hug and kiss you. I don't have to worry about that. Whereas if I was not uh, heterosexual, I would have to worry. Is people gonna think I'm like, are people gonna think I'm like from a different community if I do that? I can't do that at work. Do you know, and in, in, in the thing is 26, 26 states, if they find out that you are not heterosexual at work, you can be fired. 26 states in the U.S. 20, so that's, m m but that's about half, right? It's 52 states, that's half. Yeah, just let that sink in for, I don't have to think, I don't worry about it, I can wear a suit, a men's suit, pants, no makeup, and kiss every woman I see. No worries, don't even have to. So you know how much freedom I have in my mind? I don't have to think about that stuff. That's just like the rest of you don't have to think about being black. All the stress that goes with that. Like, just understand that you're privileged. Like, I get that I'm privileged. So when I'm around people that are from the community of people that don't identify as cishet, I understand I have privilege. And I have the ability to um, help advocate for their humanity in a way that, um, that people who are part of the community can't. Right? These are ways that we can be more humane and more um, and, and for this, have conversations, start talking about it. Y'all, reason why y'all did not know any, most of this stuff, because we're not talking to people. <laughs> so start talking about it, right? And reflect on your privilege. Take time to educate yourself. Watch films, listen to music, try new foods. Like, let, let, let's, let's try and learn more about the people around us as a way of expanding our own humanity. And for those of you that are so inclined, enga engaging in activism is also... Uh, I guess it's not working so much on the second page. Okay. Um, is engaging in, in activism, you know, it's activism is often where you spend your money. It's what leaders you support. Um, it, is, uh, it is how you share power. There's all sorts of ways that should you desire to do more than simply educate, interrupt, and show humanity. There's many things you can do. So... One beautiful inclusion recipe, you all have heard me talk about this here before, is Ubuntu, right? Ubuntu. It's very beautiful. Um, it's, this, it's this idea that our humanity is inextricably intertwined. I am because you are. I am who I am in relation to you. I cannot be happy while you are suffering. It is tying my joy in with your joy. It is understanding that re there really, really is no separation, that this we are all loving with the same love. We are all breathing the same air. We are all here to love and to grow. And when we do this together, the more of us that are doing it together, it is strengthened. If you've ever meditated alone versus coming to meditate here on a Tuesday, you can feel the difference. When we're together, it's stronger. We need each other. There was even a, a, um, a math professor uh, at a very uh, prestigious college that noticed that, uh, and it was a, uh, an advanced mathematics course, and he noticed that the group of black students, their grades were following, falling further and further behind, even though he knew that they had um, high academic credentials in order to get into this prestigious school. But the Asian students were, their grades continued to climb. And he was worried. He said, why is this happening? So he said, I'm going to follow them and see what they're doing, how they're studying, right? How are they studying? So he noticed that the Asian students were studying in groups. And so he listened to what they were doing. They were like kind of doing, you know, flashcards and like memory exercises. And then he noticed that all of the black students we're studying even more hours. He thought maybe it's poor study habits, right? Like maybe they're partying, right? Maybe they're not, right? Maybe they're out on the streets. They were putting in more hours than the Asian students, but they were studying alone, alone. 
So what he said was, study in groups. Study in groups and see what happens. In less than 30 days, all of the black students' grades turned around and they were back at the top of the class. Why? Because we need each other. We need to be in community with each other. Why did that group study work? Because they asked each other questions. They had to defend their answers. Just like we, uh, most of you were in a study tonight, right? We're studying whatever, you know, in my room we're studying, you know, med mediumship. So we're asking questions of each other. We're, you know, talking about the difficulties and what do you do? Well, here's what I do. We learn from each other. We need each other. So if we need each other, why can't we love each other too? Right? Why can't we love each other too? We need each other. So that is what I had to share with you all tonight. Um, I hope that if you learned anything,